This is Rebecca Fleetwood Hessian, host of the Badass Women's Council podcast. And I am so glad you're here today for part one of a three-part series with a very special guest, Joan Rosenberg. Joan is a PhD and a psychologist, and her latest book is 90 Seconds to a Life You Love, How to Master Your Difficult Feelings. And we had so much to cover in our session together that it required three episodes, which is a great problem to have. Joan has an amazing background that I will link to in the show notes, but the short version version is, uh, in addition to being an expert psychologist, she's been a TEDx speaker. She has been on a... uh, on PBS, the OWN Network, CNN's American Morning Show. She's contributed to Brenda Burchard's um, High Performance Academy. It just goes on and on. I hope you'll take a look at the link in the show notes. So in this first episode with Joan, she really covers the background of why she wrote the book and the how-to for building confidence, resilience, and authenticity. And don't we all just want more of that? I will tell you, when I listened to this book, there were several times during it that I actually, I was in my car on the way to Chicago, we would shout out, yes, Joan, that's it. It really hit home for me in very personal and meaningful ways. So without uh, taking up any more of my time, let's get going. Hey, Joan, how's it going today? Awesome. Thank you. Good, good. I'm so glad you could be with us today. I'm ridiculously excited to talk about this book that you've written. Thank you. I'm ridiculous, ridiculously excited to share it. Good. That's why we write them, right? So if you're going to put all that effort into it. Let's talk about them. So the name of your book is 90 Seconds to a Life You Love. Yes. Very practical, tactical, but the, but the sub of that all is how to, which is what I love about the book, it has a how to element to it, how to master your difficult feelings to cultivate lasting confidence, resilience, and authenticity. Yes. And that is, as I listened to the book, that's what really struck me is we talk a lot about those things, confidence, resilience, and authenticity, and we want them. You know, we'll read about them, we'll share We'll share pretty graphics on Instagram about them, but this gets at the real practical, tactical, how do I do that? Correct. So I'm excited to talk about that. Awesome. Awesome. So let's set things up a little bit for folks that may have just logged into the Badass Women's Council podcast and and don't have a lot of history with us yet. We talk about reflection and connection, and the high-achieving woman loves to accomplish things. She loves to do things that matter, and what we all have in common is what gets in the way of that a lot of times is what I refer to as the voices in our head, the things we tell ourselves, and the emotions we have about things, and it can oftentimes, if we're not intentional about having a practice to deal with it, it can prevent us from being, bringing our unique gifts and talents to the world. And that's where we feel that sense of belonging and like what we do matters. And so I'd love for you to just introduce us to the book because it does an amazing job of giving you that practice of saying, okay, these feelings are okay to have these feelings, but now what do I do with them? So introduce us to the overall concept of, of the book, if you will. Well, uh, let me let me give you a little background to do that. I I started out as an exquisitely shy child, mm. who, um, if you're familiar with the concept of wallflowers, I yeah. was velcroed to the wall. Interesting. So, it, and and throughout much of my childhood, I was also bullied mm. at childhood and adolescence. I mean, it, it went for many many years, and. And so I, obviously you develop a certain way of seeing the world based on your experiences. So, so the, the early years for me were about feeling like I didn't fit in. I didn't belong. I'd look over and see my peers and, and they were, uh, they were laughing. They seemed well connected to each other and they seemed confident. Mm -hmm. And it's like, 
how come I don't? It's like, what is that? How do, how do people do that? So from a very early age, uh, that, that was one question that I wrestled with. And as I got into my, the psychology and, and the, my graduate programs and then seeing clients, the second question came about, which was, what makes it so difficult for us to deal with unpleasant feelings or to, to, to experience the, and, and in essence, move through those? And, and the more time went on, so now it's decades of, of the work, that what I realized is that the second question answered the first question. Oh, fascinating. That, that actually our capacity to experience and move through unpleasant feelings has everything, with our, everything to do with our ability to develop confidence and to, and to be well-connected to ourselves. And as a result of being well-connected to ourselves, we become that much better at being able to have deep connections with others. And I think it's important to state that this is the case, whether you are that wallflower introvert or whether you're an outgoing extrovert. It does not matter. It's for everybody. Because I have said to people before, I never felt like I fit in. And I right. gave an example. Right. And, and the person I was talking to said, I can't believe that about you. I said, because I'm outgoing? And she said, yeah. And I said, that doesn't mean I wasn't battling with that internally. And it's also sometimes a coping mechanism is to be gregarious and to be outgoing because you're really trying to mask the fact that inside you're feeling insecure. Sure, so right, it's, right. It is, it's the case whether or not you're introvert or extrovert. Absolutely true. Absolutely true. So the whole premise of the book, and, I, and again, the, the concepts first started to evolve 25 years ago, believe it or not. So it's, it's really, I've had a, an opportunity to have a lifetime of, of being with the concepts and actually testing them out, working with all the people that I work with, training them, and, and then watching, because I supervise graduate students, watching them apply the same concepts and have them work with the people they're working with. So it's, it's time tested. Yeah. And, right. and the overall premise of the book is if you can experience and move through one or more 90 second waves, and in this case, and I'll, I'll, I'm sure we'll get into it, 90 second bodily sensation waves uh, uh, of one or more of eight unpleasant feelings, then you can go pursue anything you want in life. And that was the fascinating part of it is it's 90 seconds. Yep. And, and when we're feeling them, and you talk about this in the book, it can feel like hours and it's not the case. Right. But, and before we even go there, let's tell everyone the eight sure. emotions. Sure. So, so the, the 90 seconds part of the title is the method. The whole focus of the book really is, is the subtitle, which is how to master your difficult feelings. And, and the end result being transforming those unpleasant feelings, if you will, into confidence, into resilience, and into authenticity, to living a more authentic life. So, so the, the eight feelings are sadness, shame, helplessness, anger, vulnerability, embarrassment, disappointment, and frustration. I'm, I'm friends with all of them. Yes, we all, we all are, and most of us don't want to be. And, and the, first question, <laughs> the first question that I get is, how come those eight? Fear's not on there, anxiety's not on there, and people start to, why isn't this there? Well, it's not there for good reasons. So the, the, why those eight? Because those are the most common feeling reactions to things not turning out the way we need or the way we want. They're the everyday, common, spontaneous reactions we have. I just, I did a keynote speech last week and I do keynote speeches for a living. It's not a new thing, but this one had some different aspects to it last week. And I thankfully had a, a good friend to call and I said, I am swimming in a vulnerability hangover and I need you to talk me through it. You know, so recognizing those feelings too are a, a big part of it. But here's what I want you to tell us. And this is, this is interesting to me. Fear is yep. the thing that so many people want to talk about. You, you know, the, you, we've all seen the graphic, you know, everything you want is on the other side of fear. Right. Yep. How is fear not in the aid or how is it maybe related to the aid or is that an appropriate 
part of the conversation? Oh, that's a great question. I, I love the question. Um, if we look at the way psychology defines fear, then psychology describes it as danger in the moment right now. Okay. So uh, most of us, like going up and speaking, and I love speaking too, the, uh, going up and saying, I, well, I'm afraid, of, I'm afraid of public speaking or I'm fearful of it. It's not a fear. There's no danger in the moment right now. It's like, it's like, so my thing is that, that words like fear and anxiety are both misused and overused. Oh, gotcha. And, okay. and, and so I, and I talk, I talk about it in the anxiety chapter in the book, but that, that, so that I want people, and I'm really attentive to how we use language. And, and so if we are using the, the word fear, we're going to activate more of that in our bodies. So stop using it where it doesn't belong. So if you're, if you're not in a situation where you're facing danger or life threat in the moment right now, then stop using that word. And, and, be, and so it's not in the A because it's not the most common feeling reaction to things not turning out the way we need or want. Right? It's in, and, I mean, hang on one second. I can see yeah. one. Yeah. I'm excited. <laughs> no, it's awesome. The, the, <clears throat> so... What I'd rather people people do is use a different word. The most the most common next one would be anxiety. But so stop using fear. Let's re replace it instead with something else. And and if you are in danger, then be fearful. I want right. people to have that reaction where it belongs, but not where it does. And words matter. The specific yeah. word that you're using matters. And the way we talk to ourselves matters. And that's Absolutely. the other thing that I loved about the practical, tactical nature of your book is that sometimes when I talk about this, you know, if, if someone will say to me, a client or someone will say to me that I'm coaching something about, uh, well, you know, that's going to suck. Mm -hmm. And I'll say, well, it, you've pretty much guaranteed that's going to happen with that thought process. Let's, let's, yep. Let's look at that. Yep. And it's not an airy fairy. I'm being overly positive and I'm trying to get you to just fake it till you make it. It is an actual thing that your brain says, she said, it's going to suck. Get ready. It's going to suck. Your brain believes what you tell it. That's right. a thing. Yes. Yes. Well, and the other is that I talk about what we think and how we think in the book and the, what we think is the, are those actual thoughts. So the thought of it's going to suck is the what we think, but it, but if you're in a pattern of just thinking that sort of way and you never are willing to anticipate it, it could turn out really well, mm -hmm. right? Then then the pattern of just thinking and anticipating the negative is is how we think. So the pattern of thinking actually can can get in the way. In fact, when I work with people or I train. What I will often say is we have to pay attention not only to what people are thinking, we have to pay attention to how they're thinking it, or the, the patterns that they're engaged in. So, so that, that's, that's really, really crucial. It's, it's, it, it, so to your point, it's not that you're trying to be overly uh, positive or Pollyannish about something. You're actually calling attention to the fact that somebody's, got, that somebody's in a pattern of thinking where they're only anticipating the negative and they don't allow themselves to actually anticipate the other side. So it's like, if you're going to anticipate something that's going to suck, well then, then by all means start thinking about the possibilities on the other side of that, where it's something could turn out but better than you could have even ever imagined. Right. And so this is a skill that you can learn and be intentional about just like the skill of good communication or productivity or leadership. Right? Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. The the more, and this is to your point of, of awareness, that <clears throat> that the more we can be aware of the different things that we do, the the how what we're thinking, how we think it, how we experience and move through feeling, how we express our feelings, the behaviors we engage in, all those different kinds of things. The more we can be aware of that, the the more well attuned we are to ourselves, the better connected we we are with us in essence, kind of being, being able to be our own best friends. Yeah. And then, of course, the, the, more, the more well we know ourselves, is that the right way to say it? <laughs> the, the better we know ourselves then, and are more connected to ourselves, again, as I said earlier, the, 
the easier and the deeper kinds of connections we can establish with others. Life just becomes that much more enriched because of it. Absolutely. And the barrier that I find to be consistent today culturally in being able to do that well is the phenomenon I call buried under busy. That we are in this cycle of just task, 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 email, respond, get it off my plate, go, go, go. And if you haven't done any reflection in the midst of all that, you're doing yourself no favors because you're doing poor work, number one, but you're also not able to think about what's the impact or the context of all of these tasks and activities. You're just moving through stuff. And what, what you're saying is in order to be our best self, which is delivering our best work, we have to be just as intentional about our thoughts as we are about our inbox. Uh, yes. Yes. In fact, the more intentional we are about our thoughts, the better we're going to be about our inbox. Amen. Because, because what, what we start to lose sight of, to your point, we start to lose sight of what we value or what our priorities are. And yeah. so we, we get into a reactive mode and, and, you know, it's, and I mean, certainly when I see people, they, I often say people come, come into therapy from a place of reaction there so that they're reacting to life. Right. And, and part of the reaction to life is the, sometimes a lack of awareness about self. And that when, when somebody stays with me long enough, uh, then and, and hopefully the book actually takes you on the journey by itself. You move from, and I talk about this in the book, actually. I make, I make a comment about this. You move from a place of reaction to a place of creation so that you then become a co-creator with life. And part of the reason you're being a co-creator with life is because you've been able to be thoughtful about what you're thinking, how you think it, how you experience and express yourself, and, and that you, you're clear about what you value and what your priorities are and what your dreams are. And, and that those start to take the lead in how you, how you run your life or how you, how you be in your life mm-hmm. as opposed to just being in a kind of a reactive mode. That's really, really important. I, I went through about five years ago a, a period of intense self-discovery because I knew I needed to make some changes. And I did it very intentionally doing exactly what you just said. And people will now come to me and say, Wow, I watched either through social media or personal relationship, you go through that really difficult time in your life. And I was just amazed at how you did it so well. Mm. And I and I quickly point out, and this was before I read your book, I really wish I would have had your book five years ago. I'm not gonna lie. Mm. I quickly point out that that wasn't because I wasn't feeling the pain. Right. I was feeling the pain, oh, yeah. but I had prepared myself for this was going to be a journey. I was going to do it intentionally, and I was going to allow myself to, to work through those feelings in a positive way versus letting them own me or control me. That's awesome. That's great. Yeah. And, that, and when I read your book, I was just, there were several times I'm in my car on the way to Chicago listening to it, like talking out loud, yes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Very cool. I'm sorry I didn't hear it. Yeah, it was, it was really, really, it is really, really good. And I'm not coming down. You see why we needed three episodes? Lots to cover. I'm going to save on the reflection questions for today because I just want you to keep listening to the next two episodes and then we'll cover that in the final one. I never left it on the ground I'm not